are celebrating this year 199 years of the Brazilian independence. And I hope we can have a wonderful celebration and maybe in person as we always did next year. Um, to start our program, uh, we will listen to the national anthem from the United States and then Brazil. And then John will introduce Professor Mark Hansen and we will start our program. Thank you very much. Salve, salve, Brasil de amor eterno, seja assim. 
Good afternoon and welcome to the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce's celebration of Brazilian independence with the discussion of the role and influence of Dona Maria del Codina of Austria. Thank you again, Simone, for your great words at the beginning. Uh, and uh, we should we'll try to get to the main subject as soon as possible as possible. I am John Welch, Executive Director of the Brazilian American Chamber, and by hand of the Chamber, we wish you all health and happiness in this difficult time. Thank you for joining the discussion. As you know, sadly, we had to postpone our Indo Brazilian Independence Day reception set for today. On a moment's notice, uh, a friend and colleague, Dr. Mark Hansen, has agreed to lead the discussion this year on a subject that came up during the Independence Day celebration in 2020. Thank you very much, Mark, for this timely discussion on the eve of uh, 200 years since 1822. And now, before I begin this exploration, or we begin this exploration, I would also like to ask you to keep yourselves on mute while others are speaking. And if you want to ask a question, you can use the hand emoji to raise your hand. You can also put whatever question or if you need attention um, in the chat and we'll monitor as closely as possible about the questions. Dr. Mark Hansen, AB, MA and PhD in history from Columbia University joins us today. You can find his full bio on the link sent with a reminder on our website. Uh, Mark, I'm tending you the screen. Thank you, John. I'm honored to help the chamber observe the 199th anniversary of Brazilian independence and to be speaking in front of this uh, very noteworthy assembly. It seems like only yesterday we were celebrating the sesquicentenario, 100. 50 years, it was 1972, seems like yesterday, but I was 12 years old going on 13 in Sao Paulo. Those were formative years uh, in, in my own life and character. And I am so grateful uh, to continue to be a part of the Brazilian family uh, in events such as this. Now I've kind of tightened up the title of our presentation a little bit uh, for purposes of focus, it's now Dona Leopoldina of Austria, mother, consort, and ruler in the Habsburg tradition. And, and when it comes time for questions, please, you can even critique the title and uh, any other component of my presentation, but this is intended to be a discussion. So who was Dona Leopoldina? Once upon a time, I would have simply said um, the wife of Don Pedro, the man at the top of the social pyramid who declared, kind of single-handedly declared the nation's independence from the colonial overlord, Portugal, or Portugal. But now I know that would be a gross oversimplification and a grave injustice to an extraordinary and historically influential woman. By force of her character and intellect, Leopoldina not only exercised direct influence on her husband, but quite likely on other influential personages, most notably José Bonifacio at key junctures. And the, the issue here is really key junctures leading up to independence, hinges of history, as one might put it. So some people look to hinges of history, but others look and claim that other things were the real causes of Brazilian independence. Once upon a time, I would have referred and focused on broader uh, social forces, the interests of the landowners and merchant class in Sao Paulo and Minas and Latifundia, blah, 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 or the influence of enlightenment ideas of the bureaucratic class in Rio that they all acquired in Coimbra, uh, philosophies like those of the physiocrats, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, but the real, the fundamental question, and it does come into play when we consider Leopoldina is this, is history driven by individuals or groups 
by great people or ordinary people? Is it strictly by men or in bygone ages and millennia, even women? So I don't intend to caricature any particular historical school of thought, but simply emphasize that bias is always there. And again, your answer to some of these questions will depend on your theoretical starting point. And looking specifically at Brazil and Leopoldina, uh, well, the positivist uh, point of view became very influential in Brazil, especially in the late 19th century. And we all know about the Ordem Progresso uh, motto on the flag comes straight from the positivists. Uh, but, but that influence over the intellectual environment impacted uh, the, the study of history and the role of women and the role of men. So while purporting to be strictly empirical in its foundations, the social doctrine of Auguste Comte was in fact very sexist, if I may use a, an anachronistic term. Presentism is the term for trying to apply the standards of the present to a bygone era. But by our standards, he was very sexist in that the role of the woman, though highly important and prized, was preeminently that of mother and educator of children that is restricted to the home. Political life was meant to be the province of men uh, and themselves ruled over by great men, specifically the role of Republican dictator for life, which was part of the theory. And in fact, um, both Marechal Deodoro da Fonseca and Floriano Peixoto were encouraged by some sectors to assume that role. Uh, Republican dictator for life, but I guess thankfully they did not. Moving on to another point of view, though, that diminishes the role of the individual, be they male or female, obviously Marxism with the guiding principle of dialectical materialism uh, would, would obviously diminish the role of individuals. So uh, according to that worldview, somebody like uh, Leopoldina is not particularly significant. So um, again, those are starting points that will impact the way one analyzes Leopoldina. But I would like to say that um, her role in fact was as a great woman, uh, born and bred for potential greatness in various spheres. And that all started with her birth as uh, a Habsburg. But just a few of her contributions to Brazil um, as a mother, uh, not only to four who lived to adulthood, but Two of them became heads of state. At the same time though, she, and this is more on the social level, she symbolically became the mother of the Brazilians. She was beloved of the Brazilian populace. And when she died, there was a great outpouring of grief uh, to, as evidence of that fact. As consort to Pedro, uh, she promoted social progress. She was a daughter of the enlightenment and did work towards the gradual, um, took steps, early steps towards the gradual uh, extinction of slavery through the emancipation of the children born to slaves. So many of us know that in the case of Brazil, the Lei do Ventre Livre, when it was finally passed, did was the death knell of slavery in Brazil because the, the, the population was not replaced uh, organically. She promoted immigration, improvements in public sanitation, education, and in particular also um, history and uh, she established the uh, Museu Real, which later became the Museu Nacional with her own contribution of, um, of objects. And that of course is sadly uh, the, the museum that burned down in 2018. But finally, and I think this is the topic that seems to relate more to the issue at hand is her role specifically in the events of September 7th, 18. 22. And um, I would highlight that uh, as a consort, as, as, as spouse and advisor to Dom Pedro uh, from the time of, of her proxy marriage, even before she arrived in Brazil, she was corresponding with Dom Pedro and uh, through to her early death at age 29 in 1826, uh, she had an outsized impact on events. And even her death, as we'll see later, um, had a political impact, uh, but not in Pedro's favor, by the way. But finally, and this really kind of comes to the core of, of September uh, 7th, 
It's that as a ruler in her own right, as regent in charge of Brazil, heading the Council of State during that faithful month, month of September in 1822, she was, um, she was in charge of the government. I know there's a debate and I'll take a moment. I always maintained and understood that Prince Isabel was the first head of state in the Western Hemisphere. She served as regent for extended periods when Dom Pedro II was traveling abroad. Uh, most faithfully, uh, for the third uh, regency that she exercised was uh, when uh, she uh, took. She she was very proactive and and politically astute and and brought about uh, the the passing of the Lei Aurea and and influenced that in in very concrete ways. So I don't think we have anything along those lines comparable. Uh, of that kind of evidence for um, for Leopoldina and um, September seventh in eighteen twenty two, but we will consider what what we do have. So um, the question is, um, do we have to rewrite books that say though that the first head of state in the Western Hemisphere was one Brazilian, Princesa Isabel, or a different one, Dona Leopoldina? So, but let's give a quick background on. Leopoldina, born in 1787, and um, she was the granddaughter of Maria Theresa, the Habsburg Emperor, Empress, who ruled for 40 years. So Maria Theresa uh, died only seven years before Leopoldina was born. This is the heyday of the enlightened despot, people like Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, the Sun King, Louis XIV. So that's kind of the, the environment, though, Maria Theresa being as great as any of the foregoing. Um, and although Napoleon signed the death warrant of the Holy Roman Empire as such, which had been part of the pedigree of the Habsburgs, nonetheless, Leopoldina's father became Emperor Francis I of Austria. And again, so she was born into a very powerful, uh, politically powerful, uh, the other was largely symbolic. And um, in fact, uh, Leopoldina's sister married Napoleon himself uh, after Josephine had left the scene. So. Um, again, the Habsburg tradition is a powerful one that began in 1282 in the 13th century that that dynasty had been learning how to rule. And by the 1500s, uh, they, they figured out that women had some gifts too. And it was surprising to me to learn that it, under Carlos V, Charles V, I'm sorry, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, who's Carlos I of Spain, of the Habsburg house, he recognized uh, the competence of women uh, having been uh, under a regency of a woman and he later appointed uh, three princesses to uh, become regents of various regions under his control. So again, women in the Habsburgs even as early as the 16th century were exercising substantial uh, direct control and direct power and direct uh, influence. One of those three, by the way, Margaret, was responsible for assembling uh, one of the earliest collections of ethnographic objects in, from the New World, including uh, items uh, given by Montezuma, the Emperor Moctezuma, the Aztec Emperor, uh, to the Emperor Charles. So um, it's um, interesting that several hundred years later, Leopoldina likewise establishes a, a, a new collection in Brazil, and I'll mention that when she set sail to Brazil in 1817, um, she was accompanied by another ship that got there sooner, but it was a ship uh, that was uh, comprised of uh, scholars, students of, of natural sciences, artists, uh, the very famous artist Thomas Ender, who was a watercolor specialist who came to depict the new world, and, uh, and she was very much a part of that. She was trained in, in uh, what was then called natural philosophy. In her diary, we read that she said, um, for example, when she was waiting to find out if she might be married off or not, she said, well, if I don't get married to anybody, I can always devote my life to being a mineralogist. And uh, um, that was a love though of the natural sciences that, that she never gave up and brought with her to Brazil. And some of you may know that uh, her son, uh, Dom Pedro II, had that same kind of inclination towards the national, uh, I'm sorry, the natural sciences as well. But um, so those are kinds of very kind of enlightenment types of interests that she brought with her. But I'm just going to pause for a moment to recognize that 
Um, again, when we're assessing the importance of somebody, uh, and in particular, uh, this uh, personage, um, she was depicted in a novella in 2017, which I discovered. I never saw it. I don't know if any of the folks who are watching uh, watched that novella, Novo Mundo, it's a historical drama. But whenever there's a historical drama, uh, inevitably people can leave with some impressions that might be inaccurate, and that's just the nature of the beast. I'm not criticizing historical drama at all, but rather um, inviting folks to maybe share later on their own impressions of that of that novella and how it impacted their own view of uh, of well, probably Don Pedro as well as um, as well as his wife, Dona Leopoldina. But the most significant, I think, contributor to this debate right now is someone named Paulo Rezuti. And again, I don't know, maybe all of you have read all of his things. I stumbled on Paulo Rezuti's work through an audio book on Don Pedro II. So I've just been listening to his work on, on Don Pedro II and liked it. It's very detailed and it's very grounded in the original sources. He's done a lot of work in the archives. It's obvious that he loves uh, spending time in the archives and his YouTube presence now has over 200,000 followers. So there's a popularization going on here that I think is a good thing, getting people interested. And he is a, a serious independent scholar who, who pays attention to the uh, documentary evidence with, uh, I think, uh, a proper uh, respect. So um, those are some background issues. And, and again, later on, maybe some of you have read um, uh, Paulo Jesuti's specific book on Leopoldina. They, they, they come under the heading of A Historia Não Contada, The Untold Story, which is a good marketing kind of technique. Uh, but again, it, it, it's not like conspiracy theory and stuff like that. It's, it's just shedding light on, on historical information that might be not so well known. So, uh, but if we look now at the core of the question, uh, to what extent should uh, Dona Leopoldina get credit for the um, Brazil's independence from Portugal? Uh, it the, the kind of the key events unfold in a 15 month uh, period from uh, the return of uh, King John the Sixth to uh, Brazil, from Brazil to Portugal in 18, April 1821. And that's and just 15 months later, we have the Grito do Ipiranga, the Declaration of Independence in 1822. And what happens, what's going on there is quite apart from all kinds of social and economic and all those other forces, which are of course vital, without which you know that, that nothing would have happened. However, I see what was happening as a kind of high-paced transatlantic chess game. And so what was at stake? And and so some periods of history, individual decisions can uh, have a bigger or lesser impact on the outcome. And, and uh, so in the case of Brazil during that 15 month period, we had a volatile uh, political situation in Portugal, volatile situation in Brazil. We had military considerations, uh, questions of loyalty on the part of Portuguese forces uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, whether you know, some were on their way uh, but, but again, there was the question of loyalty with some of the Portuguese forces aside with the independence movement. Again, these were all unfolding very quickly. And at the same time, diplomacy was critical because the British ultimately held veto power over any, any outcome. And um, so again, a high speed, uh, high stakes, transatlantic chess game going on, uh, looking into Brazil, for example, the northern and southern ends of uh, what was at that point a part of the United Kingdom. Uh, but um, of course, Portugal was trying to restore it, relegate it to uh, colonial status. Well, the, 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 the dominant forces in the northern and southern parts of Brazil were still uh, opposed to the centralizing efforts in Rio and in favor of the decentralizing efforts that the Portuguese Cortes had uh, begun to implement. And of course, those decentralizing efforts uh, were, were in part an effort to, of course, clip the wings of the, the Rio uh, powers as well. But we, again, we're not going to totally analyze that right now. But, um, but what, 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 what the kind of the current debate hinges on is the specific uh, technical role that Dona Leopoldina plays 
when Pedro leaves on his trip uh, from um, Rio, from the capital, to the uh, province of Sao Paulo. And apparently there's even a debate as to whether he was on a horse or a mule. And I, I can't settle that one, but uh, um, there are other more significant questions at stake. And um, so he was, she was left as the regent uh, with a written document. Uh, Don Pedro leaves his wife as the regent in the capital of Rio. And, but José Bonifacio, again, in favor of independence, um, was the head of the Council of State. So these were all, this was a political organ that had been established back when uh, the court fled uh, Lisbon and established itself in Rio de Janeiro in 1808. So part of the story is that these political uh, institutions had already been put in place and were there and were available to people like Don Pedro and uh, José Bonifacio. And so it's during this trip to um, the, uh, the region of Sao Paulo that an intolerable, potentially intolerable communications come from Portugal uh, and arrive in Rio and are read there by uh, Dona Leopoldina and José Bonifacio. A meeting of the Council of State is convoked and that uh, Council of State um, uh, issues uh, a letter under the signature, I believe. And again, there's debates about who signed what. And I'm afraid I didn't have time to sort through all of this. But again, there's a lot of uh, discussion about the, the, the legal documents. And for example, the FICU, I discovered that the, 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 the wording of the FICU, como é para o, a felicidade do povo e o bem geral da nação, Diga o povo que fico that we memorized. And well, apparently there's conflicting kind of transcriptions of that too. So, uh, but I don't mean to muddy the waters here. I just want to emphasize that there are certain key facts. And uh, one of them is that the regent was Dona Leopoldina and that José Bonifacio, uh, uh, she convoked the meetings and José Bonifacio acted as head of the Council of State. And uh, so the Council of State submitted two, um, to, via courier to um, the, the, the no, he's not the emperor at this point, he's just the Principe Regente in Sao Paulo, um, the, 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 the intolerable acts, if you will, the intolerable acts of the Portuguese Cortes and uh, uh, advice from the Council of State that the time has come to declare and sever ties between Brazil and Portugal and a letter from Dona Leopoldina addressed to her husband. So I'm going to culminate this chapter of my little presentation by quoting Bradford Burns, uh, the late Bradford Burns, who wrote a standard history of Brazil. And this, by the way, is evidence that Leopoldina was not totally ignored in the kind of mainstream historiography. Burns quotes uh, Leopoldina's letter, Brazil, under your guidance, will be a great country. Brazil wants you as its monarch. Pedro, this is the most important moment of your life. You have the support of all Brazil. And Burns goes on to say, angered by the news from Lisbon and encouraged by the advice of Bonifacio and Princess Leopoldina, Pedro unsheathed his sword on the bank of the Ipiranga River and gave the cry, independence or death. So uh, how do we assign relative importance clearly to leave Leopoldina out is wrong. Uh, and um, further uh, scrutiny of uh, some of the historical documents could shed further light. And, uh, but I think at the end of the day, it's, it's gonna be mainly your own base, you know, your starting point for the interpretation of history. But um, I'm gonna conclude these remarks by sharing um, with you uh, something that's on the one hand kind of fuzzy, that is, or potentially fuzzy, the image of Leopoldina as the mother of the Brazilians, the mãe dos brasileiros. And, um, but it's, it really isn't fuzzy because it's just very well established that the common folk really did adore her. And again, I mentioned earlier, there was an outpouring of grief at her funeral, but the kind of, the, the, the kind of stereotypical image is that she was martyred, she was martyred and her death was hastened by an unfaithful and rumored to be physically abusive husband who with gross insensitivity to uh, public opinion promoted his favorite mistress Domitila ahead of his wife. 
and that Leopoldina bore this torment with saintly resignation and, uh, and that uh, resignation, that saintly resignation contributed to the manner in which he was revered by the ordinary Brazilian people. And um, so is she worthy, uh, aside from the way uh, people perceived her as the mother of all the Brazilians, I would uh, argue based on reading her youthful uh, diaries that in fact she was um, a very caring leader. She, she, she devoted herself, well, first of all, as a child, as, as, as you know, a member of a royal household, she expressed uh, interest in personal interest, individual interest in the members of her, I'm gonna call them staff, her, I guess the, 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 the wait staff, not, not just the ladies in waiting and the, the sign socially significant people who attended to her, but she cared about the coachman and, and her diary again reflects this personal care. Part of her job as, as, a, as a noble Habsburg was to care for the poor. And that was beaten, you know, that was part of their philosophy to care for the poor part of presumably a Christian kind of uh, uh, worldview. But, but, but here she really cares. It's not just fulfilling a duty, but she does care about the welfare of ordinary people. And so when she gets ready to go to Brazil, she works very hard at learning Portuguese. She already spoke French, which was the lingua franca of, of diplomacy and of court life. So she didn't have to learn uh, Portuguese on top of the French in addition to her native Germany. But again, she, she worked really, you see this in the diaries, she's working and testing her knowledge of Portuguese as much as she can before she arrives. And once she does, she insists that Portuguese be the language in, uh, used in court. So again, um, those are just a couple of tidbits that show the heart of the woman. She not only had an, a, a mind, a brilliant mind, but a very warm heart. And uh, to close, uh, I'll just, I'm going to quote the Briton Maria Graham. Now, Maria Graham ended up serving for a short time as a tutor to the royal household, but that's later. What I'm going to quote is upon her earlier visit to Brazil, a travel journal. And um, so Maria Graham had been all over the world. And this, this was her impression after meeting Leopoldina several times, quote, setting aside the consideration of the Empress's high rank, it is not a little pleasing to me to meet so well-educated and well-bred a woman. I felt quite sorry to leave her without telling her so. She is in all respects an amiable and respectable woman. No distressed person ever applies to her in vain and her conduct, both public and private, justly commands the admiration and love of her family and subjects. Her personal accomplishments would adorn the station of a private gentlewoman. Her temper, prudence, and courage fit her for high situation. Thank so you. I will end on that note. If you think that I have a high regard for Leopoldina and I'm inspired by the way she conducted her life, I am. So um, let's. Uh, so John, you're 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 in charge here. But I, again, I hope you know I'm comfortable going all over the map with this. Uh, I look forward to hearing again people's own um, exposure and opinions, maybe even passionate opinions. Uh, so John, let me turn it back to you. Well, thank you very much, Mark. That was great. And especially on such short notice. Excellent. Thank you very much. I learned a lot. That's why I won't be saying much. But um, if you want to ask a question, uh, there's a little button at the bottom that says reactions. Uh, you can raise your hand there or if you want to just raise your physical hand, but I don't see everybody's camera on. Uh, so please uh, raise your hand if you have questions or comments. Uh, before we move to that, I wanted to uh, recognize the presence of Air Force General Luis Fernando Aguiar. Uh, and also Professor William O'Keefe of Pace University. Uh, you're all very important to us, so I, I thank you again for coming. Uh, but we have a couple questions uh, ready, so I will um, quickly move on to that. So you did bring up uh, the, the sort of rumors that went around uh, Leopoldina's re relationship with Don Pedro I. Um, and there were rumors of him physically abusing Leopoldina. Can you address that a little bit, maybe uh, sure. clarify? 
Yeah, so one, one thing that I did, I did learn uh, recently was it, um, and I forget the exact date, but the, the bodies of uh, Don Pedro and of his consort of Leopoldina were exhumed. Some of you might know better than I do, but they were exhumed by the same people who, who did, uh, I guess it's Richard III over in England, but the same experts. And they are able, it's amazing what they're able to find out. I, I read about how they even exhumed um, St. Anthony, Santo Antonio, and, and can find out all kinds of things about the person through these modern techniques. But apparently the exhumation of um, Dona Leopoldina did not indicate any kind of, had no evidence of any kind of physical abuse. So um, that's, that is a fact. Uh, it's kind of an, a, a good, I, kind of a one, one, she had a tough enough life as it was. There's, there's no question there was, there was, there was serious, I think the case can be made kind of emotional abuse. I mean, having, she was forced to share the, the platform with his, his, her husband's uh, mistress uh, and, 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 the, you know, the, 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 the children, the, you know, the granting of, of, of nobility uh, honors and things of that nature. So clearly that would have to qualify as a form of, uh, of kind of emotional abuse. Uh, it didn't help Pedro's political uh, career at all, but still, it, it, uh, she died at 29. Uh, she died um, after a miscarriage. Um, again, I'm sure there can be all kinds of analyses of the medical evidence, but there's evidence that she was uh, clinically depressed. Again, being careful. I mean, if I'm a serious historian, I'm going to be careful not to be, you know, uh, passing medical judgment over the centuries. But no question, just the public treatment of her um, uh, was, was arguably a case of emotional abuse, but the people loved her. And, uh, but, but still it was kind of hard for her to live through all of that. And I'll share one other detail from, the, um, from, from, from her diaries, uh, interestingly, and it looks in those diaries that she was reading some of the, the romantics. In other words, she comes out of kind of a Habsburg enlightenment mold, but, that, but she did read the romantics. And by the way, at age six, she sang in the same choir with Franz Schubert. That's quite, uh, and, and she, she loved Franz. And at one point she says, oh, I'm really, I think he's a little bummed out. He's a little down, whatever. But, uh, but, but she was a musician. She was, um, a, but anyway, getting into the, the romantic side of her, at one point she confides in her diary, well, you know, everybody tells me you just have to put up with whoever, you know, you're stuck with as a husband. That's my own wording. But, you know, in our family, and she made a list, and I wish I had it in front of me, I apologize. Part of the problem of, of not using paper books is I can't just grab the stuff. But she created a little list of her ancestors, which of them had happy marriages, which of them had neutral marriages, and which of them had kind of bummer marriages. And there were only a couple of bad ones. So she said, I hope I, hope I carry, on, uh, carry out this tradition with my marriage. She still didn't know who, who Metternich, by the way, it's Metternich who is working on this. And, and she, uh, if I may just share a detail, uh, another detail showing her strength of character is she stood up uh, to men. Uh, Metternich was complaining about some aspect of her behavior and, and she wrote her a letter basically saying, I'm not gonna change that behavior, sorry. And uh, a letter that she wrote to her dad. So she was a, a woman of very strong character, but of course, I shouldn't say, of course, in fact, great self-control, but uh, really focused. And this was a, an amazing contrast with her husband. I know one of the arguments out there is she just had a lot of trouble adapting to a kind of a, I'm going to use the word bagunça, the bagunça of the Brazilian environment. I, that, I, you know, I, that's just, some people say it, and I don't necessarily, I don't buy into that, but I, I share it. Uh, because she was very adaptable and very respectful. And, and again, the common people loved her, but, um, but her husband was certainly not a man of, of self-control, far from it. And uh, although he was talented musically, uh, very gifted, in fact, his, his educational upbringing and uh, kind of formation did not promote self-control and deep reflection, unfortunately. So um, I'm kind of going off a little bit, but, but Don Pedro, um, is at least exonerated by the kind of the exhumation process of physically abusing uh, Dona Leopoldina.
We have a couple more questions already. Um, this is more of a meta question. Uh, I see mm -hmm. uh, Ambassador Dayo is on also. He has a question. I'll do that uh, after this one. Um, this is more of a, uh, a macro question. Um, why did uh, they choose an empire okay. as opposed to a kingdom of Brazil? Okay, that one came up last year. And um, although I didn't get the book I was looking for in the Library of Congress because it was still sitting in some some uh, a, a branch somewhere, cabin branch it's called. They never got it to the main reading room for me. But I did find in the Cambridge history, the following quote uh, by uh, Leslie Bethel on uh, that very topic. And he says, the title emperor sprang more from the liberal Masonic tradition and in Jose's Bonifacio, Jose Bonifacio's eyes, it was simply a reflection of the size of Brazil. And that does make sense. Uh, just the sheer size of Brazil does make it kind of an empire rather than a kingdom. But I would suggest also being married to a Habsburg uh, who was uh, an empress. I mean, they, they were an empire by definition. Uh, that would naturally be in the air as well. I'm, so my, my poor, uh, you know, is she gonna be demoted from empress to queen? Uh, we'll, so that, that's speculative on my part, but apparently the Masonic uh, lodges were, were, were part of that, that decision as well. So um, one of those kind of much. interesting facts. Ambassador Dario Campos would like to make, uh, take, give his question. Um, Dario, Ambassador, are you, I don't see you on the screen, but um, let's see if I can unmute you by myself. No, I can't do it. I can only ask you to do it. Uh, Marion, can you unmute Dario? I did, but- ah, there we go. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. I just want to add that to the United States of America was the first country to recognize the independence of Brazil in 1824. President James Monroe, the Brazilian government sent an ambas emissary, Ambassador Silvestre, and President Monroe said, I shall recognize the Brazilian independence as long as you show me the Constitution. And Ambassador Silvestre came back with a copy of the Constitution, and President Monroe offered him a banquet and officially recognized Brazil as an independent country. So the United yeah. States of America was the first country to recognize Brazil as an independent nation. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Yes, that, that is very significant. Um, of course, uh, England wielded a little, little more weight at that point, but, but still it, it, is, it is part of um, a, a wonderful aspect of our heritage, uh, a joint heritage as North Americans and Brazilians. Maybe you can elaborate, Mark, a little bit, if you will, uh, on the relationship, the ongoing discussions between uh, Brazilian uh, intellectuals and U.S. because I think if I'm not wrong, it predated or at least stemmed from the U.S. revolution and lasted through certainly Don Juan, uh, Don Pedro Segundo was quite uh, in, in discussions with, with uh, many people in the United States as well. Well, some some may be, yeah, it, it was, it, yeah, and I, I wish I, I knew more, but uh, maybe others do, and I'm not going to kind of try to rack my brain and remember things, but um, but but one point is that the, the members of the Inconfidencia Mineira, uh, the, the the uprising in Minas, uh, were were in correspondence with uh, with um, uh, Thomas Jefferson, and um, so. Um, uh, th th yeah, I'd rather not uh, stick my neck out and, and risk being inaccurate, but, um, but those, uh, <laughs> those are generally a known kind of acknowledged facts. That's as far as I'll go. But others may have more specific information to share. Again, I hope we can uh, make this a uh, broad discussion. But again, I want to thank the ambassador. My, my, the topic of my doctoral dissertation, by the way, was about Eduardo Prado, who, who was a great monarchist who uh, tried to, um, did everything he could to oppose the, the Republic in 1899. Yeah. But he wrote a book called A Ilusão Americana sometime maybe 1890. And he is considered 
one of the great anti-Americans of the Brazilian elite from the latter part of the 19th century. And his whole argument was that Brazil had, Brazil's interests lie more closely aligned with those of England and Europe um, uh, rather than with the United States. I disagree with him, but, but he was certainly a smart guy. And uh, so it was never, just so we acknowledge the fact that, um, you know, Pan-Americanism and um, uh, an allegiance, notwithstanding the fact that the Americans were the first to acknowledge Brazilian independence, uh, there have been others who have argued over, over the years for closer ties with, with, with Europe. Uh, so I will share that little, little bit. But perhaps others have something to add. I remind you again, you certainly welcome to speak up. Uh, raise your hand physically, although we don't have everybody with their cameras on or use the little reaction button at the bottom to give us a little hands up. So I don't know if anybody uh, has any further questions. I see Bruno Simões has raised his hand. Oh, there we go. Yes, there it is. Great, thank you, Bruno. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor, for your, for your words. Uh, mm -hmm. I happened to be in Philadelphia two days ago where I delivered a speech for, for the Independence Day on behalf mm -hmm. of the Consul General. And I did some research about the specific episode of uh, people from Minas Gerais trying to reach the founding fathers. Mm. Uh, what I could find is there was a few Brazilian students in Montpellier in France mm. that were able to contact uh, Thomas Jefferson when Thomas Jefferson was the ambassador of France, uh, uh, ambassador of the United States to France. Uh, before the election of George Washington, uh, and they tried to begin some sort of conversation, but Thomas Jefferson was not very much convinced. Mm -hmm. uh, when Thomas Jefferson became a Secretary of State of President Washington, uh, there is a document written by him to the president in which he states that uh, Brazil must be independent by its own means. Mm. or we should not try to intervene in Brazil to help any sort of rebellion. Uh, mm. What is not said by Thomas Jefferson, but what I was told is that there was, there was a special relationship between Portugal and the United States uh, from previous to the American Revolution. Uh, the Portuguese had a lot of interest in Boston and there was a strong cooperation in whaling between Portugal mm. and the United States. Mm. Uh, the, the first consulate general, or the first consulate of Portugal in the United States is pre predates American independence. So they were not willing to pick another fight uh, with a country mm. that was a uh, source of uh, good relations in Europe. Mm. Uh, if you may allow me, I'd like, like to comment on what happened in the Council of State and the the so -called please, the decision, please, right? Please, this, is please. Maybe, this is maybe the great question because mm -hmm, some people you. say, uh, because of the telenovela, some mm. people say that Leopoldina decreed the independence of Brazil, uh, which she was not allowed to do so. Uh, mm. What there was was uh, a, a decree by Dom Pedro as, uh, as the regent of Brazil, allowing her to preside over these meetings while he was uh, abroad, went, went to Sao Paulo, went to Santos and everything. But there is a discussion, ongoing discussion in historiography mm -hmm. on the content of information that was sent to the prince when he was met by the delegation in Ipiranga River. Mm -hmm. uh, they say that there might be a piece of information that is lost. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a, a very good study by uh, Professor Carlos Oberacker called mm -hmm. The Cry of Ipiranga in Historiography. And they try to rebuild all the narratives that are available and counting the number of, 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 of letters that were given to the prince when he was, uh, when he met the courier uh, near mm -hmm. the Ipiranga River. And apparently there is one letter that is missing mm -hmm. and nobody knows what is written there, right? <laughs> and also, when you read the, 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 the transcripts <laughs> of the Council of State uh, mm -hmm. for, the, uh, for September the 2nd, uh, it was written by Gonçalves Ledo, 
Gonçalves so Ledo mm. was a republicanist, uh, kind of the rival of José Bonifácio mm. within the government. They had different lodges, Masonic lodges, yeah. where they would be liderating. So the, it, it's very, it's very scarce. You know, the transcription mm. is very scarce. Apparently, they only decided to inform the prince of what was happening in Lisbon. So this is this is the main question that is still to be uh, researched, and eventually we may never find uh, if, if there was no copies left anywhere. Uh, they mm. might only have we may have lost the letters. But what is apparently uh, uh, consistent in all of this is that whatever the information was, the prince had a strong decision to make, and he decided to do so before entering the city. And this is very important because mm. there was no time to lose. He could enter the city and make some sort of a fuss with an assembly and everything. No, he decided there with a few people around him that it was over. So mm. they were to go back to Rio and prepare for a war against Portugal. So I think this is the main, uh, the main uh, discussion that, that is different from the process here in the United States where there was a moment that people sit to write a document that became a, a declaration of independence. Some people say that we should consider our declaration of independence, uh, the manifest by José Bonifácio that was published on uh, August the 6th, uh, the Manifest of the Nations, where it states a lot of reasons against the, against the, the, the parliament in Lisbon. But the, but the main issue is, Dom Pedro was the heir to the throne in Portugal. So there was no sense in, in disrupting the United Kingdom by him, because he was the person that was to better profit of everything, right? So we still have a lot to study about that, but uh, I'd like to, to commend you for our great uh, conference. Okay, thank you very much. That's very kind of you, sir, and, and thank you. That's, that, that is, that, that's excellent um, elucidation and, and addition, and, and it, you did confirm for me that there isn't a smoking gun yet. In other words, it's still up for debate, and and uh, but that makes it exciting for historians. There's still some, you know, it's a lot of fun to, to uh, the quest. The quest continues. Uh, so thank you. And and by the way, so yes, that's 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 interesting about Jose Bonifacio because um, I was aware of that document. I've never read it, but secondary secondarily, but yes, the Declaration of Independence of this country explicitly says that we are explaining to the nations of the world. It is incumbent upon us to explain to the nations why we're doing this. And so José Bonifacio's parallel to that was that letter. Uh, and, and that's important. Um, and and I need one, to read it. Thank you crucial, for sharing. One crucial yeah, difference ahead, between the United States and Brazil, and that is, in Latin America in general, mm -hmm. is that criollos, which is a Spanish word, anyone born into aristocracy but in the, the new world, didn't have full uh, rights as a citizen. Whereas Americans or English, the children of English people in the United States had full rights. And that's why you say we were being, our rights are being violated as English citizens in the Declaration of Independence. And uh, later they made sure that they, they said, now we are citizens of this new country. So that's, and that was very important in the Inconfidencia Minera, which came the closest thing to a liberal uprising, similar to the United States because of taxation on gold, they were not tried as full citizens. Uh, and then they were very quickly um, done away with. I think that uh, that particular legacy of the Iberian Peninsula haunts Latin America to this day, that plus having Roman law. But uh, this, I always look at this as an economist as opposed to anything else. I think Vitor Granja had a question. Vitor, are you, are you still, you, you, would you like to ask your question? Yes, I had a question, but then I lowered because I couldn't do the video. <laughs> and, but Mark, my question is, I arrived a little bit late, so I'm not, I'm not sure if you covered it already, but you know, royal marriages in Europe were pretty much, you know, political alliances. Yes. They were more, they were more like interest, you know, for the interest of the country, anything. My question is, why would Austria be interested in Portugal, especially when the royal family was in conflict with its kingdom in Portugal and everything? And then so I was kind of like wondering, you know, why would Austria want to have an alliance with Portugal, especially during a, you know, a period that they were going through independence and expansion? Well, um, I, just a couple of things is that the interest was, um, I think, because of Brazil. 
I think my my this is what every everybody writes that I've read uh, that 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 they were interested in getting a, a toehold in the new world. So that would have been a toehold, you know, through through Portugal, they would have had a they would have had a connection with that whole realm. I think they probably recognize the future potential of of Brazil as well as its existing potential. Um, so yes, it was strictly a kind of a uh, a, a marriage, uh, a dynastic, strictly based on the uh, political and economic interest. And by the way, it was done by proxy. She was married, by the way, uh, in Europe, and, and the Brazilian uh, representative played the role of Dom Pedro. They were married, um, you know, early in, in, in 1817 in, 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 in Vienna, and but but the marriage was only consummated. No, forgive me, but I guess technically there needs to be a consummation, and that only occurred after she arrived in uh, in, in in Brazil. But there was a bishop there and everything. So yeah, this is all strictly. Uh, you know, I I didn't know the term in Portuguese. Casamento por procuração. Uh, in English, it's proxy. So, uh, but but anyway, the idea was to get a connection with with uh, the new world and the Brazil, uh, Brazilian potential. But, but they also anticipated, in fact, that Dom Pedro and Leopoldina would come back to Europe and be closer to the family. And, um, but, but, but in fact, Leopoldina devoted herself to Brazil. She never saw it as, what a bummer, what a sacrifice. I wish I could go back to Europe. She really did dedicate her heart to her new land. But, um, but th th that's the information I have in, in, in responding to your question, and, and thanks for posing it. Do you have any follow-up? Yeah, I, or, let me make a, yeah. a comment to the extent that I know history, Brazilian history. Um, Br Brazil is different than the rest of uh, Spanish America or Latin America in that uh, until there was no gold at first. There was no alluvial gold. There was no like civilizations to sit on top of or anything like that. So. And the Spanish were in a in, were shell shocked. They had just finally gotten their uh, their territory back from the Moors, and they had basically a command economy. So, uh, if you're going to if you're going to be an outsider trying to get into the New World, uh, other than perhaps in, in the col British colonies, Brazil made a lot more sense because it was much more open, and it was a thriving commercial uh, economy until they found gold, and then. Of course, but still, the the clampdown by the Portuguese crown was nowhere near as dirigiste as the Spaniards. It was a complete command economy. It it, it resembles the Soviet Union, right? And and that's and it also there was massive territory that was basically uninhabited. So I think that may be another reason. This is I'm speculating a bit on this, but uh, I thought that might add something. Anybody else? I know we have some historians that studied at Columbia University in the audience. I'm waiting them for, for them to pipe up, but it doesn't look like they're going to say anything. <laughs> Our chair uh, studied history at, at Columbia. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, we're getting close to the top of the hour. And uh, unless anybody has anything uh, to mention, Simone, nothing, or question. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Hansen. Thank you very much for this. Great. I learned a ton again, just like last year. So, uh, and thank you all for joining. Uh, we do have uh, another event coming up on the 21st, uh, where we will have a webinar 10 a.m. Sounds so boring after this on mergers and acquisitions. <laughs> but until then, <laughs> please stay i just oh i have one other question did the proxy have to grow that little mustache beard thing before <laughs> <laughs> anyway stay happy and healthy uh, and we'll see you soon thank you all for joining thank, thank you, you. Bye, thank, everybody. you. thank you dr hansen thank you my pleasure my pleasure